Broadcasting from Silicon Valley, California, this is Conversations with Jenny Lynn. You're watching Conversations with Jenny Lynn, and as I continue my COVID-19 World Interview Series, this morning we are in the Bahamas once again. And this time, I have the honor of interviewing this beautiful woman, and she is a lawyer, Zoe Camille Allison Maynard Gibson. She's a lawyer who served as an elected member of the Parliament of the Bahamas and the Ministry of the Financial Services. She's also the longest serving living person to serve as the Attorney General. Zoe Camille Allison, welcome to Conversations with Jenny Lynn. Thank you. Thank you. It's an honor to be here, Jenny Lynn. And please call me Allison. Everybody does. Okay. Uh, I wasn't sure which name you wanted me to call you. So Allison. Okay. Please. Thank you so I much. I love Zoe. And do you know what? Camille has always been my favorite name. And I was raised Catholic. And when I made my back, when I got my holy confirmation, that's the name I chose. Wow, how interesting. How Isn't interesting. That's funny. Yeah, it is. Anyway, um, thank you again for taking the time. You're such a busy woman wearing so many hats that I feel honored that you made time for me today. It's my pleasure to do so. Thank you for inviting me. I am honored to be a part of your program, having read about your distinguished series. Thank you for including me. Oh, thank you. I'm looking in your home and I'm thinking, when I go to the Bahamas, I'm coming to visit you. Well, I want you to come. I told you we would love to have you here in the Bahamas. Thank you. So tell me, you are serving currently as the Attorney General in the Bahamas? Oh, no, no. Um, I served as Attorney General uh, when the party of which I was a member of the government uh, was in power until oh. 2017. Okay. At the moment, I am a consultant to a law firm called Clement Maynard and Company. I'm also a visiting scholar at the Harvard School of Public Health. And I'm working very actively uh, in the international arena in the access to justice space, as well as being a very happy wife and mother and grandmother. Oh, wow. Congratulations. You're a grandmother? I tell you, I'm so happy. I'm in, I'm in what's called the grandparents' heaven, and I'm happily so there. I hear it's much more fun being a grandmother than a mom. I'm waiting to find out. <laughs> I've enjoyed both. They're both very special. Okay. So at the moment, you're working as a consultant in a law firm, but as a lawyer in the Bahamas, do you want to share a little bit about that with us, what that's like? Well, I just, I'd like to talk about the Bahamas, really, and the Bahamian people, or more about okay. people than myself. Okay. I'd like to say that I, I invite people to look um, at the globe, and you'll see a dot just off the coast of West Palm Beach, yeah. and that's the Bahamas. The Bahamian people are amazing people, 360,000 people, um, and of our population, we have had more road scholars per capita than any country in the world. We're a sovereign nation, five road scholars. Wow. We've had Academy Award winners, Grammy Award winners, we have Bahamians who work at NASA. We have Bahamians who have won gold medals in international athletic competitions, both the Olympics and other, like the Pan Am Games, um, and on and on. Exhibitors at the Museum of Modern Art, participants in wonderful choirs around the world, and so forth. And so I'd like to say, Jenny, and if you, if you think about a population that side, which, which is like a village uh, in America or a village in Europe, if so many, if that village was producing so many people of such high distinction, people would be saying, well, what's happening there? We should go and study those people. So I invite you and others who are listening to pay attention to the Bahamas. This is an incredible country with incredible people. And, and I invite you to come. Thank you. And I will take you up. On, this is the second time this week I've been invited. And as soon as, as it is possible, I promise you, I will be in the Bahamas. I must ask you, was the Bahamas a British territory? Yes, we were formerly a British ter territory. Uh, we became independent um, on July 10th, 1973. Okay. And knowing that you are a woman of faith, 
I want to say to you that I think that our constitution is the only constitution of any sovereign nation in the world that celebrates that it is a nation committed to Christian values in its constitution. That explains all its successes. <laughs> I really believe when God is part of something, there's no way it can do anything but succeed. And if you really are, if you really are treating God as as you are supposed to in its true essence, because there's so many people that talk about God, and I'm like, who are they talking about? Because well, it's, it's we're not perfect. We're well, not perfect, but what I can say to what you have said is amen. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. So you were born and raised in the Bahamas? I was born and raised in the Bahamas. I, I of course, attended school abroad, as you will see from my resume, uh, and also universities abroad, and I've lived and worked abroad as well. So which, which universities did you attend, just so that other people who don't have access to your resume? Because we're Thank curious you. about you. Thank you. I'm a distinguished alumna of Barry University, of which I was the youngest graduate, I still am on record, at 18, at, uh, with my Bachelor of Science degree. Oh, wow. And I went on to the London School of Economics and Political Science, where I pursued an LLB and an LLM. Wow. And I'm called to the bar in the England, uh, UK and Wales, and I'm called to the bar in the Bahamas. Wow, look at you. I love women like yourself. I mean, I love all women. I support all women, but women who are driven. I really I'm like on the shoulders of um, women in my family like that. And also in our country, we have so many um, hardworking, noble women who support uh, younger people coming behind them. And so I stand on their shoulders and I hope that I, as I move from day to day and work from day to day that I'm honoring their legacy. I'm sure you are. There's no doubt in my mind that you are. Thank what you. did you find the most challenging as a lawyer in the Bahamas? Um, that's a good question. I just think, well, I want to say that I, I work, I strive from day to day to make sure that in practice and in the public and the private sphere, just to keep in touch with people and to make sure that actually we're serving people. So in the private sphere, serving my clients, and in the public sphere, recognizing that the Bahamian people are my clients. It's sometimes difficult to remember that. And so we get, as I study and speak about access to justice, a part of the problem is that lawyers and judges and others who participate in that institution, the delivery of justice, get tied up in processes and uh, in the institution itself, as opposed to remembering that we are serving people as clients. And so people-centered justice is what we, to our constant reminder that that's what we are about. And I think that's always the challenge to keep it front and center in your mind. Yes. One thing I find very challenging as a, a civilian is understanding the legal lingo. It sounds like sometimes I've had to deal with legal issues in my own life and I receive letters from my lawyer and I feel like I'm dealing with a science project. Well, you know, you just, you've, you've just hit the nail on the head because that is precisely what people are complaining about. And they're saying that, look, just keep it simple. I'd like to have a solution to a problem and I don't really want to get tied up in what they call, and I'm not saying so disrespectfully, mumbo jumbo. Yes. I just want to solve my problem. Yes, because for those of us who haven't had the knowledge and the training lawyers have had, understanding their language is very difficult sometimes. And I credit myself with being intelligent, but even then I have a problem sometimes understanding. And I know that the Brit... The, I would imagine in Bahamas, your law has a more British slant to it since you were a British territory. Absolutely. Um, British, uh, British cases and so forth form part of our law and we, uh, we follow them. But you've, I want to congratulate you again for hitting the nail on the head. Uh, like, I, like I said, around the world, people are just simply concerned about how, listen, how do I get my problem solved? Yes. Sometimes when I get a letter, I think of like the strawberry pickers here in California for whom English is a second language. And I think when they have to like process their immigration papers, how difficult it must be for them. I always think about these things 
and wonder why it isn't written in simpler, more comprehensive language. Maybe that's something you can help change. It's being done that way. I mean, you see, for example, uh, institutions, uh, a lot of innovators are actually having doc legal documents online so okay. that people can just fill in the blanks and get a contract. Oh, that's great. Kinds of things. So these are all moves in the right direction to give people access to justice or access to, to the means by which they can solve their problems. Right, because I wonder how many people sometimes end up incriminated, even though they're innocent, just because they didn't understand what was going on. It does happen, unfortunately. Oh, I bet. And so in the U.S., you are a lawyer, but um, according to the British terminology and in your country, you're a barrister. Yeah, we have... Um, we have person you can be you can practice as an attorney here if you have been called to the bar in england so a barrister as i have been or if you are a solicitor and as you know in england it's a divided profession so there are barristers and solicitors but here it is a merged profession so you can be either and ultimately become a lawyer or an attorney here in the bahamas oh they're different mm -hmm. Oh, I thought it was the same as just a matter of the name. Thank you for clarifying that. So after all your years of being exposed in the, to the legal field and working in it, what would you change if you could? I would stick with exactly what we're talking about right now. And that is what I'm working on right now. on um, making sure that we find ways to really focus on people centered justice however you look at it. Make it easier for people to resolve their disputes. They don't have to go to court necessarily to resolve disputes. Around the world, we can rely on traditional leaders. We can rely on justices of the peace. We can rely on mediation, arbitration, all kinds of other ways to, to rapidly have disputes resolved. Um, also using means, you've referred to it, a technology whereby people can get a contract by just filling in the blanks online. Um, and I, I like to use the public health analogy where people recognize, governments recognize that there is a benefit to society of having people have things like running water, things like to, uh, people being vaccinated, using telemedicine to reach remote areas. If we transpose that to the legal arena, wherever we are in the world, we want to make sure that people can have access to the legal system and it doesn't have to be lawyers. There can be paralegals, like you have nurses, assistants, nurse practitioners, that same kind of analogy to help people have quick and easy access to resolve disputes. Thank you, especially when we get letters in the mail so that we can read them and understand what they're telling us. Very, it's very, very important, very important. And thank you for understanding that. Yes, thank you for clarifying that because I always wonder why why is it so difficult if it's difficult for me? What is it like, especially where I live, where so many people are from other countries and English is their second language? It must be tremendously painful for them. Then they have to go pay someone to interpret the letter and they're already, you know, struggling to survive. So that was something that's bothered me over the years. And I'm happy to hear, at least in your country, they're working on simplifying those documents. It's happening in other places around the world too, in, in America. Unfortunately, people are, are not aware that it is happening because the, the problem is so big. But um, in America, it's happening. In, uh, on the African continent, it's happening. In Europe, it's happening. There are a lot of people working on this issue and understanding that justice is so important that it is that you really have to have people feel that they're issues are being can be resolved and it's being called not just access to justice but people-centered justice i wonder why it's taken this many years to do something so necessary you know something the the the, the hope and the good thing is that now people recognize its importance mm -hmm. and i do believe that it is growing uh, rapidly and we're going to yeah. see results well, thank you so much. It's so wonderful to have a conversation with an expert in the field. Now, tell me, what has it been like for you and your family with this pandemic? How is it affecting your immediate environment? 
And the well, country, as far as you know. I've taken some notes about our numbers. I'm just looking at them right now. Right. Our total uh, COVID cases of 102. We've had 11 deaths. And we've had um, 2,134 people tested. The Bahamas has been like countries around the world that don't have the strong healthcare systems like you have in America in many of your states. And so when the pandemic, when we became aware that we were dealing with a pandemic and how rapidly it was spreading, our government took rapid steps to make sure that our public health system would not be overwhelmed. So we would see a situation in the Bahamas like people were seeing in Italy and New York and other places. Right. So it implemented very strict lockdown, let me call them lockdown measures. Um, our country is just beginning now to open up. Um, we, as of June, we had weekend lockdowns, we have curfews still imposed and that kind of thing. A lot of education around wearing masks, which are mandatory if you go outside, um, and hygiene, hand hygiene and that kind of thing, hand sanitizing, washing hands. Um, and so the success of this strategy is that the public health system has been able to cope with the pandemic. Right. So again, we're not perfect, but to the extent that we've been able to not be uh, a country that is like Italy or certain parts of Italy or the pictures that we saw in New York and that kind of thing, where they had these massive deaths because of um, the pandemic. I think that the way that we've approached it has been very successful. You know, I, I just wish that people are watching these interviews because that's one of the reasons I decided to do it. I've been producing my show for 10 years. And I got, thank you. And I just got tired of hearing everybody saying, we don't know what to believe. The news is so sensationalized or slanted one way or the other. And I thought, since I have these skills and Zoom makes it so easy, why not? you know, try to get as many interviews I can around the world and just share from people's perspective with no sensation what they're experiencing. And I could not fathom it would go in this direction. Well, I'm grateful to God that I've had this opportunity. Absolutely. Well, we are also thankful that we, that I told you about how, and this is, this is an amazing country when we have people that have been exposed and are celebrated around the world. Um, at the moment, the leader of the uh, strategy, the, the anti-COVID strategy, is a woman who has been awarded by PAHO for her skills. Um, and then we have, her name is Dr. Mercelyn Dal Regis. I'd love to interview her. You should. Okay. Our prime minister is a physician. Our former minister of health is a physician. We have physicians that are award-winning physicians and highly trained uh, at you know, top institutions around the world and highly respected uh, in, their, in their fields, not just here, but around the world also. And so we've been really blessed to have an, an amazing team of scientists that have been leading uh, this thrust. We're now trying to deal uh, with the recovery because the, well, the whole world, like the whole world we are, you know, once everything was shut down, it had really a dire economic consequences for every country. Of course. So our country is now emerging and that's what we're focusing now on and now. Yeah, well, one of the things I was going to tell you is every single country that I've interviewed, the common thread when the numbers were low was lockdown. Mm -hmm. And yet there's so many people that I dialogue with daily that really take issue with it and think it's stupid. And it's like, watch these shows and listen to what people are saying. Your numbers are low. And you are, like you say, a country that doesn't have a sophisticated healthcare system like the US. We have it, but the average person doesn't even have access to it. Well, we also have access, really great access, as everybody does, to the internet and, the, and cable TV and all of that. Yeah. And so was, if, if anybody had any skepticism about our scientists here in the Bahamas, and I don't think that we don't, that we do, I think we trust our scientists, they listen to Dr. Fauci, for example, and he speaks about the need for 
physical distancing, hand washing, hand sanitizing, wearing a mask. And these are really simple things. He's not suggesting that it's a perfect solution. Yeah. But what he's saying is that you do your best until we get a vaccination. And that's what we're doing. So what do you think of all these protesters? It's like they forgot that we have a pandemic going on. Have you seen them out in the streets? A lot of them aren't even wearing masks. Yeah, I, I think that's a different kind of situation right now. There's, but there is so much um, emotion and anger and so forth, hurt attached to what's going on that um, I can understand people being, listen, we have to make a, a point. Many are wearing masks, some are not wearing masks. Um, and I actually, watching from afar, I, um, I admire the fact that people in America, and in fact, people all over the world, imagine 50 states and countries all over the world of all ages, races, nationalities, taking a stand for justice. Yes. This is a really important inflection point, I think, in world history. And I think, I hope that in the same way that we emerge from COVID transformed, that we also emerge from the pandemic of injustice and racism transformed. I hope so too. I mm -hmm. really do. I feel that it's time. And I'm a black woman. And when I say this to people, they look at me and go, you're not black. And because I look like this, because my mother looks like you, same complexion. You look a lot like my mother. Mm -hmm. uh, my father is white. So when people, when I tell people I'm black, they don't believe me. But because I don't appear as a black woman, unless you know, I have heard and I've experienced the other side of having a different color skin. And it's always bothered me but you get to a place in your life where you feel like there's nothing you can do to change it. So you just turn a blind eye to it or you let it slide off of your back. But when someone is losing their life, like this gentleman did, I know we have to do something to change that. Like you say, it is a pandemic. And it's a pandemic that's been ignored for too long. Far too long. And, and as you have said, you know, people will look at you and, and assume certain things. But you know, as we uh, become more and more aware, for example, of the fact that the first man came from Africa as a black man, you realize that life emerged from Africa, from black people. And so we really, rather than having uh, a negative attitude towards that continent or towards black people, we look at us as a source of life. You know, it's so funny. That, isn't that a different perspective? Exactly. Well, it's interesting that you're saying this because yesterday I interviewed a physician in South Africa who is white. And I asked him this question, you know, what he thought of this pandemic, the racial mm -hmm. pandemic. And he shared with me how sick and tired and disgusted he is with it. And then he referenced his medical school days where you know, there's all this talk about white people being superior, and yet all of the demos that they used for a lot of his projects were black people. And when you went into the science, all of the structure of that black person was identical to the white person. Well, and we're, so, human. Uh, we're human and anthropologists, you have to go, I mean, Google's available to everybody, anthropologists, and so have told us this is the source of life. There's no question about it. Yes. But you know, when you, when you are ignorant and when you are angry, yeah. it doesn't matter what the facts say. It's a choice you have to make to accept that we're all equal. And if you refuse to do that because it's serving some purpose, feeding into your anger or your ignorance, it doesn't matter what, that's how you will think. That's how you will behave, and that's how you will treat people that are not your color. And that's the sad truth. Yeah, but thank God for our young people who are prepared to take a stand. And uh, Reverend Al Sharpton, who, who eulogized um, yesterday at, the, at yeah. the funeral, made the point that years ago, um, he would have been attacked and terrible words thrown at him. 
and he had a young 11 year old girl. She, he was waiting for some abusive statement and she held up her fist and said, no justice, no peace, a white girl. And so he's pointing to the fact that things are changing. The walls of ignorance are being brought down. And with this, we will see tremendous change. It's up to us to make sure that the momentum continues and we give it fuel. Yes, I just hope that we do it in a sensible way because there have been some demonstrations that have been, have been so destructive. I'm thinking, why are we doing this if we're doing, if we're doing it in such a destruct, destructive fashion? Because then we're really not accomplishing the point of, of the demonstrations. Well, I'm not, I'm not in America. You, you are, and you're in California yeah. where there yeah. were demonstrations. But I wonder, let me ask you the question. I wasn't sure that it was the demonstrators being destructive as opposed to looters who came in with another objective altogether. Oh, it's, that's so, probably what happened. I don't know. I'm asking you, right? That's what my, happened in my neighborhood, but I have a very good girlfriend in Los Angeles. And yesterday she went out to get food and she called me. She said she was very depressed because Target and all of these stores have been boarded up. Right because they were looted and that the store she was allowed into hardly had anything inside because of the looting. That's what I'm referring to. But because I wasn't there to see it, I had assumed that there was the same people. Maybe not. That's what I would like to ask the question. Yeah. Is there a difference between those who are peacefully demonstrating and making a point and those who are looting? And that's different yes. from those who are peacefully demonstrating and yeah. making a point. But what I'm trying to show you is how that darkness still has to come in when something good is happening. I to understand. To appear as though the demonstrators are the ones who are doing this. Well, hopefully people like yourself who actually throw light on the darkness will encourage others to recognize that there is a difference between someone or between people who are demonstrating around the world for a positive cause and those who are trying to distract from that positive cause by looting. Yes. You don't have those types of situations as much in the Bahamas, do you? Um, we don't at this moment. We have, in, a, in fact, today in the Bahamas is Sir Randall Fawkes Labor Day. Um, and so we celebrate a hero. We're celebrating working people. Okay. We're celebrating a hero whose life was dedicated to the rights of working people. And I think the nearest thing we had to that was a general strike, um, which was in the late 50s. Um, but generally speaking, Bahamians are a very, very peace-loving uh, Christian, very, very spiritual people. What does it take to become a citizen of the Bahamas? <laughs> Come and be born here. <laughs> <That's a little laughs> I'll say, we, we are... We are you know, you've used an important word, citizenship, that has a legal meaning, okay? Uh -huh. It also has an emotional meaning. But, and, and there are many, many people from all around the world who live in the Bahamas. They have a home in the Bahamas. They've made magnificent contributions to our national tapestry, to our national development. Uh -huh. And we regard them as citizens because they have become a part of who we are. You're a natural fiber. They can't vote. A citizen can vote. They can't vote, but they're not, they don't want to vote. They just want to come and live and be a part of the Bahamas and help us develop this wonderful country that is the Bahamas. And we, are, we welcome them as a part of who we are. How far are you from Miami? On a flight, I'm not sure the miles, on a flight, uh, Jet, um, it will take maybe 45 minutes. You're 40, close. very close. In fact, um, one of our islands, we are an archipelagic nation, as you know, one of our islands, Bimini, is so close to Miami that you can actually, on a nice clear night, you can see the lights on the horizon of Florida. That's cool. Yes. That really yeah. is. So as, a, as someone who served as an attorney general and a barrister and a lawyer and all of the work you've done in that arena, what changes would you like to see in the world? And do you think they can be accomplished anytime soon? I think that the, the answer is yes. I, I, I do think that, I wouldn't say soon, there are certain things that can be soon. Um, like you made the point, 
I'd like to focus on access to justice because that's really something I feel really strongly about. And I, I'm defining it very broadly, not just resolving legal issues, but I think it is just to make sure that people have access to good housing, access to health care, things that are human rights is what I mean by access to justice. Okay, So we can do things immediately, or to use your word soon, to make sure that we minimize the inequalities that exist around housing and access to health care. But I think over the long term, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take a long term uh, strategy, a long term vision uh, to make sure that economic inequalities, um, disparities around legal rights, discrimination against women, uh, abuse of children, that kind of thing. But I think that we've come a really long way and we need to, uh, as, in the same way that you are shedding light on these dark areas that exist around the world, more and more people are becoming aware they're using technology as you are using Zoom and other, and other platforms to get the message out. And the good news is that things are changing, um, not as fast as we would like. I, I think the hope though is that we have a wonderful, impatient, young people <laughs> who are anxious to see uh, a world that is more fair. I saw an article the other day um, that was speaking about um, uh, policies around for companies that should focus on stakeholder rights rather than shareholder rights right. to promote equity in the world. So, you know, things are changing and I think these are the things to celebrate. That's great. Um, is everyone in your country privy to socialized medicine? We have, um, yes, we have um, a public hospital. Okay. Um, the, we, like I said to you, we are an archipelagic nation, so we don't have the same facilities on every island. Okay. But persons are able to be uh, airlifted to uh, our hospital uh, in New Providence. Hurricane Dorian regrettably significantly damaged some of our clinics and also the main hospital on one of our other main islands called Grand Bahama. But yes, people, we have, we have something called national health insurance okay. that has now been implemented and is developing. And generally it focuses on access to primary health care. So that we also focus on preventing a lot of illnesses. We have a problem with non-communicable disease, high blood pressure and that kind of thing. Oh. And so primary health care is really trying to make sure that our children, we give access to everybody and we try to make sure our children understand that these are avoidable uh, health conditions. That's really wonderful. I mean, the U.S. for all that's, you know, we, not everyone here has access to health care. And I wonder, um, you know, for some people, if they, if they get COVID, if, how are they able to afford treatment? I've been thinking about that and I'm not sure. But you said that you had a lot of testing in your country. You mentioned a few thousands were tested. That's correct. I'm looking again at my notes. We, we, we don't, we don't, I don't think that anybody, including the government, thinks that we've actually done enough testing, right? What is enough testing? Because our whole focus has been on making sure that people don't become infected. Right. Because we were focusing on making sure that our health facilities could actually cope with whatever situation emerged. So we're happy that our total cases are only 102. Deaths have only been 11. One death is too many. But when you think about other places or what happened in other places around the world, I think we can say that 11 is a good batting average. Remarkable is yeah. what I would say. Like I said, one is too many. Exactly. But but considering other countries, I think it's remarkable that that volume had. I and like that. Know, what I've been thinking about, and, and I don't know if you can shed light on this, is with the testing. You can test me today, and I can test negative. Mm -hmm. And I am still living. I may come in contact with someone who is asymptomatic. And then I get exposed. So what does that mean that I was tested? Exactly. I don't about that. So is the testing that important? Well, I'm not a, I'm not a scientist, but yeah, as a no. scientist say, yes, we don't. For example, at the moment, uh, while we were on our lockdown mode, 
uh, people could not come into the Bahamas at all unless they had been tested. Oh. And not just one of those, not just the quick test. We adopted the what was what our scientists call the gold standard, which is a PCR molecular swab test. Oh, okay. And they were so strict that they only accepted these tests from certain certified labs. So again, we also think that shutting down our borders to prevent persons who might be coming in with, you have to have a negative, PCR negative. And so these are all strategies that we believe, like I said, um, led to the success of our, of our position, our policy. I'm not a scientist, um, so I don't want to comment too much about testing. But, but I want to go back to what scientists have said, and that is to make sure that you physical distance, may, uh, wear a mask, hand sanitizing, lots of hand washing, that kind of thing. And it appears to be working. Well, we are out of time, but I am not going to let you go unless I ask you, what have you learned about yourself during this pandemic? I've learned that I am actually a whole lot more patient and willing to listen and able to listen than I thought that I was. Um, I've been praying a lot about the need to become more patient. My grandmother used to say to me, um, remember that you have two ears and one mouth, so listen a whole lot more than you speak. And I think that the pandemic, um, because things should not be different after, after such a drum, cataclysmic event in the world. And so I'm hoping that since I am listening more than I speak, that that has helped me to become a changed person. Thank you so Don't much. Don't ask my family whether they agree. <laughs> That's my view. <laughs> well, thank you so much. We have just met, and I can assure you that you are a good listener because you couldn't be and have done the fabulous job you've done over the years in the legal space. So I know you're a good listener. Well, thank you for that vote of confidence. I appreciate it. <laughs> and again, I thank you so very much for carving out time out of your holiday. To, to allow me to put to rake you over the coals. <laughs> it's an honor. Thank you for considering me and inviting me. And I just want to encourage you to continue to do all the wonderful things that you're doing. I hope that you will, God will put strength and wisdom and courage uh, as wind under your wings because the world really needs what you're doing, which is enlightening people. I love you so much and we've just met. Thank you. I am coming to the Bahamas to visit you all. And thank you for your contributions you've made to the world over the years. Clearly you are someone who's touched many lives. You're touching mine now. Thank you. And so um, stay safe and we will be in touch. And thank you so much for watching Conversations with Jenny Lynn. When a conversation is all you need to be inspired, and I know you have because this is a very inspirational, fabulous one.